So, so you never get past 400? Uh, at 420, 420. Wow, I think that's kind of how many tries you've ever run. Yeah, uh, can you send me like one of your pictures where it's 400 and then you're going to have that loose one? Oh, yeah, that's... Like, you know, like, what is your... Uh, the it's one, two... Oh, you mean... The GA. I'm, I'm saying the CA. Uh, one exact individual that produced fi over 500 is one, two... Five two five five two one one two five one. Oh, ABCD. Oh, ABCD. Just the plug directly into your CA. No, that's that's we, we, what do we get from the GA? I mean, it it it, 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 it evolved. Yeah, yeah. What, we, do you, what do you? What do you? Use? We tried a bunch of them, like population size. Of, mostly we tried with fifty. Population, 50. population size. Then the conversion size is 12. Right? Yeah, that's probably. And then based. the uh, crossover. Crossover rate is something like 0.5. And the mutation. 0.05.1. And then the. Oh, oh, three, three. 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 Yes. Yeah. So, so we, after a bunch of runs, you know, some huge so ones, overnight ones, we kind of what convinced that, that 517 is really kind of optimal. We can never find. I see. see, I see my line has to come out of 500. I see hers, hers definitely of eight. I did. <laughs> uh huh? I did eight. Oh, I you did eight. it? You did it with eight? And it still was like 460. Oh. Never really exceeded really? 400. That can be true. I, I know it's such a one of my answers. Yeah. yeah. I did to a point nine still like point nine is is, like, <laughs> is crazy. I mean, it's basically you're sharper. You know what? I'm gonna it's start over every time. <laughs> Make no sense. Uh, yes, in each part of the Yeah, I think so, but I think even, even if you... It's like a composite justice system. Oh, even, Melanie? Yeah, yeah, Melanie is teaching it. Uh, if I can get I mean, 100, I can move even, on. Even if you, you don't run the G at all. Oh, I'm running GA. Uh, I mean, even if you don't run the GA at all, uh, no J at all, uh -huh. we are getting this kind of good solution out of a large population. <laughs> yeah, just randomly. Yeah, just randomly. It's, 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 it's like, pretty like, like a population. Like 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 yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty easy to get past 100 right you now. Didn't, you didn't change anything, right? You didn't change the problem. You didn't change the problem. Yeah, yeah. You didn't. We, we, we ch and what are you, Brazilian? We changed. Like, like, now, I mean, it's one of the things that I'm going to find. Nike. Crossover. Uh, no, 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 it's just Nike. Let's go back to the top. Let's go back to the top. Sure. Or be nice. Hola. 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 Uh, did you focus one? Which one? Oh, I see. Infection. In fact, there's a kind of finish. A finish. A finish. At least finish. 500. Uh, yeah. Mine never exists. It's, it's, it's not normalized. Yeah. Yeah. I have right. just put the numbers. So you didn't change the mutation function. No, but we didn't change the Yeah, we. 
I mean, by then we didn't change, change it, and we are getting five, uh, already getting over five hundred. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, there can be something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, with yeah, yeah. CAs. Yeah, I need tomorrow. I mean. As as you yeah. can see, show more of getting always five hundred and twenty. We get five hundred and seventeen. That's kind of my. <laughs> <laughs> I, I suppose it will just. I was looking at you last time. I mean, <laughs> look at you kind of improve more. Somebody, more somebody can kind of be just. I mean, I don't want to be more. Do you have a do one to seven? Yeah. One to seven. Yeah. No, 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 Um, so, since we've been talking about uh, the early, you know the early history of computer science in the 1930s and these different notions of computation, um, so we talked a little bit about uh, about these things, but. Of course, sometimes I can't remember what I've actually talked about. You know, I'm, I'm getting old. So did I tell you that, here's how recursive functions work. Did I tell you that the idea is that, well, you can compute 0. That seems reasonable to let you do that. And I'm also going to let you compute what's called the successor function. That seems reasonable. Okay. So recursive function theory is this mathematical framework that was invented in the, kind of from starting, well, I guess in some, maybe going, but sort of between 1880 and 1930, roughly. And again, the, you know, back then people were trying, basically these paradoxes made people very nervous. So it sort of started with Cantor, which I would say isn't actually paradoxical, it just tells you that some infinities are bigger than others. But then there were these other paradoxes. So people were trying to um, come up with a firm framework for set theory. And I know, you know, depending on your personality, you may or may not find the idea of finding a firm framework for set theory very uh, exciting. But, but people were upset about Russell's paradox because very smart German logicians had figured out axioms of set theory that they felt were, you know, would make things really work and you could prove all the things you wanted to prove. And Russell said, well, let A be the set, the set of all sets, such that X is not an element of itself. And this is the barber again, right? The barber who shaves people who don't shave themselves. And the point is that is is A in this set. Well, according to its definition, A is an element of A if and only if A is not an element of A. So, you know, it's one thing to take an English sentence like uh, this sentence is false or if this sentence is true, then Santa Claus exists. And it's one thing to take that sentence and say, oh, well, that's a silly sentence. But we're not supposed to be able to say, oh, that's a silly mathematical question, at least not if you're a serious mathematician. So the fact that in some people's set theory, you can define this paradoxical set made people very nervous. Because what if it turns out, I mean, how, where, how many paradoxes are lurking out, lurking around there, right? You can take each one and change your mathematical definitions to say, we're not allowed to define this. Okay, good. All right, no more paradox. But maybe these paradoxes are everywhere. And, you know, 
philosophically, what if even the areas of mathematics, like calculus or something, or algebra, turn out to have paradoxes lurking at their cores, and everything that we've been doing for the past 400 years is nonsense? And we've just been lucky not to bump into these paradoxes yet. So back then, people really wanted this kind of very formal approach to mathematics, where we would have these axioms, and every proof could be written if you really wanted to in this very formal style with these axioms. And everything would be this kind of mechanical process, and there would be no danger of fuzzy thinking or paradoxes sneaking in. No working mathematician works this way. You know, we all feel none of us are axiomatic thinkers. We all feel free to use whatever metaphors or analogies we can think of. Um, but the program back then, in the early part of the 20th century, was to axiomatize mathematics, put it on this firm footing. So um, did I already say all of this? No? No. OK, good. <laughs> all right. So I practiced these things in the shower, and then I can't remember if I've actually <laughs> said them to you. <clears throat> all right. So functions are a lot like sets. And so you know, people wanted to have a kind of firm foundation for how to define functions. And it's going to be an inductive definition. The idea is there are going to be certain very, very simple functions which we are given for free. And it, it doesn't seem like zero and adding one to things is too much to ask. And by the way, these are all functions in the natural numbers, zero, one, two, and so on. So we're going to start with these. And then I'm going to be given um, three rules for making new functions from old ones. So if you have f and g, you can make, well, for one thing, you can make their composition. That seems pretty reasonable. If you can calculate f and you can calculate g, you can calculate f composed with g by applying g and, by applying g and then f. Um, another thing which, it se which seems reasonable is to define functions in terms of their values at smaller inputs. So let me write this down. It might look slightly abstract. At first, the idea is that h of 0, comma y will be f of y. Uh, if x is bigger than 1, sorry, bigger than 0, h of x comma y will be g of, well, the idea is that I should let h at x, it could depend on x, it could depend on y, but it can also depend on its previous value. OK? So let's do an example. Um, consider the following h of 0, comma y equals y. Uh, I actually kind of snuck in the identity function here. Yes, you can have the identity function. Um, I'm even going to give you functions which will take multiple inputs and pick one of them out. That seems reasonable. OK. This is just an example. This would be i 3, comma 2 or something, because it picks out the second thing out of 3 i1 comma 1 is just the identity. So I'm going to, so here's, here's an attempt to define a function using this setup here. So h of 0 comma y is y. And um, I actually would rather put x plus 1 over here. I, this is the same thing. Uh, it's just I've changed x to x plus 1. So then um, h of x plus 1 comma y will be h of x comma y plus 1. And I can do this because what I really mean is it's the successor of h of x comma y. OK? Tell me what h of x comma y is. Successor of h of x minus 1 comma y. Yes? And then you reach the recursive. Yes. 
Y so at the end of the day, what will h of x comma y be? X zero y. Just y. X y. Succession, succession, y. Succession is how much? Yes. X times y. Then we reach h zero. Uh, not x times y, right? X plus y. It'll be x plus y. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? X of 2 comma y is the successor of x of, sorry, h of 2 comma y is the successor of h of 1 comma y, which is the successor of h comma 0 y, which is the successor of the successor of y, which is y plus 2. And in general, h of x comma y, when you sort of unfold, this description will give you the successor done x times to y, which means x plus y. Okay? So, now that we have h, now that we know what h is, I'm going to call it plus. And, of course, we can do more. So now I'm going to define a new function called times. Times of 0 comma y is 0. Times of x plus 1 comma y is what? Y times, y times, y times. Sorry, what? Y plus. It will be plus, so it will be y plus what? Times, times x, y. y. Sorry about the similarity between times and x. <laughs> oh, okay. So we can certainly, you know, and of course we can play the same game again and get exponentiation. And we can do all sorts of other things, too. Um, and for instance, uh, so, here, so here we have composition. This framework here is called primitive recursion. And the functions you can get from these basic functions with just composition and primitive recursion are called the primitive recursive functions. Um, and they include, like I said last time, most of what we do on computers. For instance, they, there's also a function prime. Prime of x returns 1 if x is prime and 0 if x is not prime. That's primitive recursive. So basically anything whose running time is, it could be a polynomial, it could be an exponential. It could be a tower of exponentials. <laughs> So last time we talked about this Ackermann function, which sort of does all those things, and it gets worse and worse. As long as you sort of cut yourself off at one level of that, you would have a primitive recursive function. So I know that this looks very, uh, this looks like a very laborious way to do things like add. But again, it's 1905, and you're trying to really rebuild mathematics from the ground up in a very philosophically careful way. And you don't want to just start with addition for free. You want to build it. So you can build it. Of course, you have to start somewhere, but this is enough. Now, in terms of programming, so one of the nice things is that these philosophical ideas really survive today in various forms in the programming languages that we use now. So what is composition in terms of programming? Function, nested function calls? Yeah, it's a function calling another function. It's, it's like a subroutine, right? Yeah. You know, saying, well, I already have a function g. I have a function f. Now I can have a function which calls g, then calls f on the result. And of course, we can actually just write it this way in any sort of reasonable language. Um, so that's like, yes, function, functions calling other functions. Um, notice, though, that in this setup, it's, so the only way that a function gets to call itself here is in this setup where one of its inputs has gotten one smaller. So I'm not, and, and notice that the way this works is if you already have f and g, then you can make h. But this setup does not actually let me have f call g and have g call f, right? So it's a little bit like in C or Pascal, where 
you know, the compiler will get mad at you if you call a function that you haven't already defined farther up. And if you want to define it later, you have to declare it. Well, this is like really strictly saying you can only call on functions that you defined earlier. Okay? Because that's this inductive process of you start out with these functions, you can make new ones and put them in the bag. Then if you have a couple of functions, f and g in the bag, you can make new ones that way. But you're always defining functions in terms of previously defined functions. So we're allowing recursion, but only in a pretty limited way. Um, so if this is like subroutines, what is, what is this like? And we already kind of said this last time, but how would you actually write an algorithm for this? So, of course, you could write it like this. <laughs> and that would be a recursive program. But what if I told you, oh, I don't want a recursive program. I want an iterative program. For loop. Then it would be a for loop, right? It would just, you know, it would start out, um, so, you know, Let's write it. Let's write the pseudocode for it. H of x comma y. If if x is zero, return what? F y. F of y. Else, um, actually, we don't even need this. We don't even need this like that. We could say okay, h equals f of y, and then for i equals one. 2x, <coughs> which notice if x is 0, this loop won't run at all, um, set h equal to g of x, y, and h. So we'll iterate this g function until x is built up to the amount that we want, and then finally return h. And notice that this is I, what I called last time a, a vanilla for loop, right? This is not a for loop in which you're doing perverse things for which your programming professors should knock half your score off, like entering a for loop and then changing the limit of the loop once you're inside. This is a good old-fashioned for loop from, you know, I don't know, basic or something, uh, where i is getting dutifully incremented every time, and we're going to go through the loop x times, and that's what we're going to do. All right. <clears throat> so in general, the primitive recursive functions are the ones which you can write in a kind of stripped-down language where you can only call functions that have been defined previously, and you can only have for loops. And this kind of for loop where you, know, you really know how many times you're going to run. So um, for a while, it was thought that, th that the primitive recursive functions already included every function which, well, here we get a bit philosophical, but every reasonable function, every function which we should regard as computable by any sort of mechanical process. Um, and then people like uh, Rosa Peter and... Um, this guy Ackerman and others came up with crazy functions like the ones I described, like the one I described last time, where you know when x is one it's addition and when x is two it's multiplication and when x is three it's exponentiation, and what's happening is that um, you need one nested for loop in the case of x equals one. For x equals two you need two nested for loops. For x equals three you need three nested for loops, and to calculate it, calculate it in general no fixed program written in this for loop language will do. Because any particular program only has a certain depth of nesting. And so it will break. It won't be able to, to calculate this function when x is bigger than that depth. So it was, you know, basically people wrote down functions where and, and they were able to prove. And the proof, as you can imagine, is kind of takes some work. But they were able to prove that there's no way to write that function down with these rules. Um, and the intuition has to do with this depth of nesting, but make, turning that into a proof takes some work, which we won't do. Um, so then people came up with a third rule. And the third rule is sometimes called minimization 
it's not actually minimizing the function, but it is finding the smallest something. So the idea is, if you have, if you already have defined or built a function f of x comma y, you can make the following function. I'll call it g of x, and it is the smallest y. Um, it's yeah, it's the smallest y such that f of x comma y is zero. Okay. So this is sort of like it's sort of like finding the first root of an equation, right? It's saying, well, whatever x is, what is the smallest y that makes this function of two variables equal to zero? That's the y I want. So what kind of loop does it take to make this function in our modern programming language? Try every x. And what kind of loop would I use to do that? Or try every y, I think you mean. Oh, yeah. Sorry? A while loop. So we start out that y equals 0, and then we say, as long as f of x comma y isn't 0, then, if you don't mind, the plus plus, set y equal to y plus 1. All right, that's <laughs> Try the next one. As soon as you find one that works, you drop out of the while loop and you return y. So why can't I do this with a for loop? Because you know, never know when it terminates. Yeah. yeah, we don't know in advance how big y could be. So in particular, I mean, as we've talked about a couple times, the thing, the y we're looking for, it could be the counterexample to some mathematical conjecture. And there might not be any counterexamples. Right? So in that case, this program never halts. And in that case, we would say that this function is undefined if there is no such y. Okay? And this is a so this is a big deal because all these functions are they're all defined. Their programs all halt. You know, in the for loop world, you, every program will halt because you know in advance how many times the loop will run. Here it could run forever. And so this is where the halting problem first appears. And I won't, you know, we already proved that the halting problem is undecidable, but in the, in the recursive function world, the idea is that there's no recursive function which can tell whether some other recursive function is defined or not. Which can tell, which which means whether the uh, analogous program will halt. Now, how would you hand a recursive function to a recursive function? Well, we, you can hand programs to programs, as we've said 60 times, because programs have source code, and the source code is just a finite string, and you can hand it to a program like any other finite string. In this world, handing a function another function as input, it's much less clear how to do that. And, well, people found a way to do it. It's, it's actually kind of ugly and awkward. What you do is you say that, um, you say, I'm going to call this function, I don't know, 3 and this function 5. I'm making these things up arbitrarily. And then if I have, I'm going to give every function a number. So I'm saying like 0, the number of 0 is 3 and the number of s is 5. Then I'm going to say that if you co combine two things by composition, I'm going to do something like the number of h will be 2 to the number of f times 3 to the number of g. For instance, right? Well, the point is that what I'm doing is I'm giving every function an integer attached to it, an integer name. And because... You know, if I tell you that a number is a power of 2 times a power of 3, those things are unequivocally defined. 
So I know this seems very awkward and tortured, but it's a way of taking any function defined recursively this way and giving it a name which is just an integer. And now that it's just an integer, you can hand it to another function as input. Okay? And now you can ask, now that you have this name, this naming device, you can ask, is there any, is there any recursive function which tells whether other recursive functions are defined? And then for exactly the same reason that there's no program that can tell whether other programs will halt, you again use this diagonal trick and there's no such function. I mean the two and three are integer representation of the function? Well, I'm saying recursively, right? We start, every function starts with these. And then, you know, I'm going to say, well, if you make it with, with composition, call it this. If you make it with primitive recursion uh, involving f and g, call those things this or something. And then what ends up happening is that any particular function is built from these with some number of stages. So it ends up having this gargantuan integer. Okay which is its name, okay? And I know that this, seem, this seems like work that you don't, I mean, nowadays, we, this, again, this, a program has this dual role. It's a function which does something to its inputs and returns an output, but it, it's also this string, its source code. But back then, it wasn't so obvious how to have this dual role that allows you to feed things to other things. So you had to do this kind of thing, which is called Gödel numbering, which happily we no longer need to do. But I want to, I want you to share the pain of these people in the 1920s and 30s. So they, you know, so, so they only work with numbers, right? I mean, they were thinking about functions of integers. They weren't thinking about programs because no one had invented programming. Sure. No one had invented a programming language besides kind of Babbage and Otto Lovelace with fours and whiles and functions calling other functions, right? It's so easy for us to think of these constructs now. It was rather hard to think of them then. Yeah? So does uh, adding minimization gives you uh, the ability to write more powerful functions than say if you only had composition and primitive recursion? Exactly, so the function, like the Ackerman function that we wrote down last time, you can do it with this. Because this while loop, one thing this while loop allows you to do is interpret programs, right? Because it allows you to run them for as long as they need to run until they halt. Whereas for a for loop, you can't do that unless you know in advance how long it will run. And remember, we talked last time about the fact that this stripped down programming language, which only has for loops and not while loops, you cannot write an interpreter for that language in that language. But with while loops, now you can write an interpreter for C in C and an interpreter for a Lisp in Lisp. Okay. And because of that, programs might halt, or they might fail to halt. And because of that, there's a halting problem, and you can't solve the halting problem. Okay, so somehow you need a certain amount of power for a program to be able to express itself or interpret itself, compile itself, right? I mean, compilers were usually, how do you write a C compiler? You write it in C, and then you run it on itself to compile it. Mm -hmm. So this kind of self-reference has become a, a, a daily activity now, this kind of snake biting its own tail. But it also creates paradoxes and undecidable problems like the halting problem. All right, so just again, for his, so mainly for historical purposes, now that we've talked about recursive functions, so by the way, if what you can do with these is called primitive recursive, what you can do with these and this are called recursive or also partial recursive because now, since the function might be undefined, it is a partial function, a function which is not necessarily defined on all its inputs. <clears throat> All right. So um, now let's look at, again, going back to the 1930s. So this is just a few years before the Turing machine. So basically, when Turing came along with the Turing machine, everybody said, ah, yes, that's the right definition 
of what functions are computable. But before that, there were still these competing definitions. So having shown you recursive functions, let me show you another one, which I know some of you have already seen, um, and that's the lambda calculus. So how many of you have already seen the lambda calculus? And I'll bet you loved it. Well, I, I actually, I had to, I did not love the lambda calculus. I, I, in fact, I don't love it now. I, I, I like it. Um, so those of you who, uh, it took me a while to like it. It's grown on me. Um, so those of you who've already seen it as part of a programming paradigms course about, fun, you would know where, where uh, well, just a, in some sense, just as imperative languages with fours and whiles are descended historically from recursive functions, functional languages like Lisp and Scheme are descended from Lisp. Uh, fr uh, from, from the Lambda Calculus. So this was invented by the logician Church of the Church Turing thesis. And um, I promise that we're only going to talk about it today. So um, here's the idea. Here's a function. OK, what the, you know. All right, well, we can see that this function is adding two things together, but what is all this, what are all these lambdas and dots? So um, the idea is that this is a function of two variables, but it's actually not. It's actually a function of one variable, x. Um, and if you give it a particular x, like 3, what does it do? It takes this 3 and it says, oh, well, I have a lambda x over here, so I'm going to substitute 3 everywhere I see x. And after I do that, I now have this thing. This is a function of one variable, y, which adds 3 to y. So now, if I put 5, it says, oh, well, I plug 5 in for y. Now I have 3 plus 5, and now I get 8. And now I have a function of no variables at all. I just have an answer. Okay. Except, as we'll see, we don't, in kind of the pure lambda calculus, even numbers are functions. So there's never any just answer. Um, so this thing here, this trick, is called currying. And the idea is that and, and again, this may seem a little tortured at the moment, but the, the idea is to think of a function of two variables as a function of one variable, which returns a function on the other variable. OK? So you give me x, and I return a function which adds x to y. That's the idea. All right. So um, now, why? Okay, so, so Church came up with the lambda calculus, and all it ever does is substitute strings in for variables in other strings. That's all it does. Okay? Um, and you can see that this is the basic thing it does. Um, so Church initially, sort of the pure lambda calculus, does not have the symbol plus or symbols for 3 and 5. So he, he wanted to, again, he was one of these guys who was trying to build up mathematics from ground zero. Um, so you know the saying that uh, God created the integers and all the rest is the work of man. Well, he wanted to make the integers too. So, uh, so here's the idea. Zero is going to be the following thing, which, again, it, it has taken me a while to get used to these things. So first of all, what is lambda x dot x? It's a function which takes x, and what does it do with it? Just x returns it does not It's the identity function. Okay. So if you give it 7, it says, oh, I put x in for, I put 7 into x. There we go. All right, so it's the identity function. What is lambda f dot lambda x dot x? 
Uh, no, not quite. It's a function which takes functions f, ignores them completely, and returns the identity function. Okay. So I mean, if you put any f here, it says, oh, I'll just put, I'll put, uh, uh, yeah. I'll just put that in for f everywhere in here, but f doesn't appear here, so I just get lambda x dot x. So another way to put this is that if you take this thing, which I'm going to call 0, and apply it to f, it returns the identity function. But another way that I can define the identity function is it's the function which, when you give it x, it applies f 0 times. Right? What does it mean to apply a function no times at all? It means don't do anything. All right? OK, good. So what is 1 going to be? Well, 1 will take lambda of f, lambda of x, and return fx. What does it do? Well, if you give it fx, it plugs in f for f, it plugs in x for x, and you get f applied to x. So 1 is the following function. It takes two things, f and x, and it returns f of x. It's the function which applies something to something else once. So the parentheses can get confusing, so let's write, write it like that. And then 2 is this. And so in general, the, the, intuitively, the numeral n, if you take n and you hand it f and you hand it x, it returns f iterated n times on x. Okay? All right? So, I mean, if you don't have the integers, you have to get them somewhere. So, okay. so the idea now is now things like the successor and addition and multiplication can be defined in terms of these things. So what should the successor do? Well, the successor, uh, what should this function be? Well, you give it a numeral n, and it should do something with n and return a new numeral, which is n plus 1. Yep. That thing is going to have f's and x's. And so what it's going to do is it's going to take this, which is f applied n times to x, and apply f one more time. Mm. So it just puts another f outside and changes f done n times to f n, uh, n plus 1 times. Plus is kind of cute. What should plus be? It should be a function which takes two numerals, n and m. And what it's going to do um, and one of the cute things is we don't necessarily even we don't necessarily need to, need to talk about all these internal things. So I'm going to take n and m, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply um, I'm going to apply f m times to whatever, and then apply f n more times to that. OK? There shouldn't be successors. No. Another way to do it, you're absolutely right, another way to do it would be if you want to add n to m, just iterate the successor n times. In fact, do we even need this? 
I'm not sure. I've never actually taken any of these programming courses with Scheme and Wisp, so you know, if you have, you might be better at this than I am. All right, multiplication is cute. Um, I apparently so I, I worked. I managed to work this out last night. What about exponentiation? So if I give you n and m, how do I get n raised to the m? It turns out that you can do it like this. That looks very mysterious. The point is that what this says is, so you should think of these, these numerals as high level functions. They take other functions. It takes the function f and turns it into the function f done n times. Well, this says, this says take this thing which changes f to f done n times, what happens if we do it again? f done n times n times is f done n squared times. Do this n times and you get f done n to the m times. All right, so it's one of these things which is kind of spare and elegant and also very hard to understand. <laughs> um, very hard to read, I think, unless you've had a lot of practice in it. Yes? So the negative integers define way f inverse? Oh, well, I suppose you could invent negative integers, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, we've only, we're only trying to invent the natural numbers. Anyway, okay, so again, besides this philosophical motivation, Let's suppose, let's suppose, okay, thank you, Mr. Church, for building this foundation. If you don't mind, from now on, we will simply refer to these things as 0, 1, 2, and 3. And from now on, we will feel free to use the symbol plus and even the symbol times to make these things a little bit less lambda-y and a little bit more readable for us humans. Okay, you can do that. But there is still a very nice aspect of this whole setup. And so again, you've heard about um, uh, first class objects, right? So what's a first class object in programming? Or a first class function? I'm asking you because I'm not sure I know this precisely myself. I'm, I'm honestly asking. I think it means you can manipulate it as easily as the other primitive objects like numbers. And then is there a second class one? Sure. Okay. Well, this is embarrassing, but again, I haven't taken 357 or 51. Um, but the, um, suppose that, I mean, suppose that you're writing in C. And, you know, C is wonderful for writing functions whose inputs are numbers or strings. But what about a function whose input is a function? So you want a function called iterate, which takes a function f and an integer n and returns, in some sense, f done n times. Well, in a lot of programming languages, this is actually very hard to do. So in C, the only, no, the only way I know how to do this is horrible, which is get into the machine and hand me a pointer to this function. Yuck. And then like go to that place and call that, you know, send the control flow there <laughs> n times. Ugh. I mean, you know, try writing a program of more than 50 lines using that sort of thing and you know there'll be bugs that you know you'll you know there'll be seg faults all over the place so this seems like a reasonable thing to want to do in a, in a language like lisp okay so by the way what about c++ um, you can create classes objects and they can contain methods so you could do you could do a method and so then create a new method I guess that would work. You could also, you could kind of do this with a template, but that's kind of, templates are cheating. It's like something that, that happens at compile time. It's not really doing this when the program runs. Um, anyway, in lots of programming languages, 
functions that work on other functions are, are a pain, and you really have to use a crowbar to do it. But in scheme or lisp, functions are just strings. Every, every string is a function, and every function is a string. And there's very, you know, there's also no distinction here, there, or at least there's much less distinction made between source code and compiled code. It's like, this is the code. And the code, there's running equals compiling for Lisp. When you run the program, it starts saying, oh, this string tells me to substitute this string here, here, and here. That was one step of the program. And then another step substitutes this string here, here, and here. And so it just does this substitution process and repeatedly does that until, well, we, we analogous to the problem in, in an imperative language, we could have a program that never halts. Here we could have a string that just gets into an endless loop in the substitution and never simplifies all the way down. Or it could even grow without bound and get longer and longer until we run out of memory. So we have a kind of halting problem. But if, all, if everything works, we keep substituting and eventually simplifies, and it gives us an answer. Um, so it's a very different type of programming. And I think it's really nice that uh, it has an ancestor philosophically and intellectually, which is this other notion of computation from the 1930s. Um, so Church, you know, they were at a meeting, and Church said, Professor Gödel, what do you think of lambda calculus? And Gödel said, I don't like it at all. <laughs> said, you know, he said, there's, there's no philosophical justification for this, because Church then claimed that, so Church claimed that lambda calculus covers everything, that any function which is computable by any mechanical process can be computed this way. And I think if you look at it and, and you put yourself in the shoes of someone who has never seen a programming language like Lisp or Scheme, that's not obvious at all. It can clearly do a lot, but can it do everything that we would expect from a programming language? I don't think that's totally clear. So in, it, it was proved that it can. Specifically, the logician Clean proved that lambda calculus equals recursive functions, including mu. So he showed that these two things are exactly equal in the functions that they can calculate. And then a few years later, Turing came along and proved that Turing machines are equivalent to these. But it wasn't until the Turing machine that Gödel was really happy. So um, uh, let's end today by talking about the Turing machine, and then we'll really be done with this whole 1930s part of the course. Um, but first, I have to show you one really cute thing from the lambda calculus. So, <coughs> and this is also quite mysterious at first. So let me first phrase it in terms of imperative programming languages. I have a program M, which stands for modifier. What it does is it eats other programs P. So you hand it the source code. It does something to the source code. And it prints out a new program, P prime. OK? And M can be anything at all. And by the way, you know, if it prints out a nonsense that doesn't compile, OK, it prints out nonsense that doesn't compile. But at least some of the time, it prints out a program which you could then compile and run. Now, if you don't mind, let me define F of P as the function that P computes. I mean, the idea is that um, uh, you know, two programs might have very different source code, but maybe they actually do, at the end of the day, the same thing. OK? So here's a theorem. For any program modifying program M, there is a program P. 
such that it does exactly the same thing after having been modified as it did before. I find this very strange. So, I mean, your modifier does something crazy. I mean, let, let's say that everywhere it says return x, it says, you know, return uh, return the x prime. And everywhere where it says 4, it changes it into a while. And I don't know what else it does. Okay, But there's always some program which the modifier has no effect on what the program does. Again, the source code could change. I'm just saying that what the program does doesn't change. The relationship between its inputs and its outputs is the same. The proof of this is, again, a diagonalization trick. And the idea here is that, well, if, if the modified program was different everywhere, then it couldn't be in our list of programs. But it is in our list of programs. So there has to be at least one program for which the modifier doesn't make a difference. All right. So, still, what, what the heck are we talking about here? Um, now, one thing a program can do is hang and never halt. So, certainly in some cases, that's going to be the fixed point. So, for example, suppose your modifier, everywhere where it said x, it changed it. Everywhere where it said return x, it changed it to return x plus 1. Okay, well then, f of p is, sorry, f of m of p is f of p plus 1. It takes whatever output p was going to give and it adds 1 to it. Well, the only way this cannot be different from this is if they're both undefined and it never halts. So in that case, my fixed point is hang, do forever, blah. Okay. But there are more interesting cases. So imagine my modifier does this. It, uh, if you hand it p, it, it comes up with a new program, p prime. And here's what it does. So if p took an input x, p prime also takes an input x. And it says, if x is 0 or x is 1, return 1. Else return p of x minus 1 plus p of x minus 2. So now this is saying that p prime of x is p of x minus 1 plus p of x minus 2. Well, if p, or, or I guess f of p prime equals f of p, well, you know what I mean, right? So here, the fixed point is the function which calculates the Fibonacci numbers. OK? All right. So here's uh, an amazing fact. In the lambda calculus, there is a thing, y, which you can actually write down, which takes any function f. It's a function of a function. And the function it gives is the fixed point of f. So I, I'm sorry, I, I'm using f in a different way. I should say m. It takes our program modifier m and returns the fixed point. OK? So it actually finds this fixed point. Not only does there exist one, it, it gives it to you. So, well, let's look at it. Y is lambda m, and then lambda x, m applied to xx, and x. What the heck? Well, let's try it out. So what happens when I put in a particular function m here? What does it do? Well, it plugs that m into this m and that m. 
So I, I guess I shouldn't be using the same symbol for variables and particular values of the variables. Let's say that m is g. So the idea is that y times g will be the fixed point of g. OK. Still happy, or at least as happy as you were before? <laughs> OK, so now I get y of x, g of xx, y of x, g of xx. OK, well, this is a function which says take a string x and create g of x, xx. And then I hand it this for x. So if this is x, then xx is this. But this function returns g of xx. But this is g of yg. So yg is the fixed point. All right, so at this point, I don't blame you if you think that this is totally meaningless, you know, tossing around of symbols. But the amazing thing is that you can write this as a program in Lisp or Scheme. And if you hand it another, I mean, which is a string, all programs are strings, and if you hand it another program which modifies programs, it will actually return the fixed point of that modifier. And how does it do it? Well, the point is that this is also g of g of yg. And it's also g of g of g of yg. So in practice, what, the, your, you know, what your computer will actually do if you hand it this string is it will apply the program modifier over and over again until it gets an answer. Same as me. And that's exactly the right thing to do. And in the case of this Fibonacci recurrence, for instance, it will apply this thing recursively until it gets down to these base cases. But I still find this quite amazing. So Y here is called the fixed point combinator. You can find lots of good stuff about this kind of stuff on Wikipedia. And there are many other fixed point combinators. So um, there is something marvelous here. Because, so did you, by any chance, in one of your programming classes, do the exercise of a program which prints out itself? Prints out its own source code? Well, this is a good exercise. Because at first, you think that you're forced to have some infinite regress, right? So I mean. You start saying, oh, well, print. Well, what's the first thing you need to print? Well, you have to print the print command and uh, so on. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it looks as if this isn't going to work. Now, um, so uh, another, another way to put this is, how could I make paradoxes in, in English about, like, this sentence is false, if I wasn't allowed to say this sentence, OK? So I mean, of course, if you have a programming language in which there's a special token called self, which equals the source code, print self works. But that's cheating, OK? So how can we really do this? So this is something which I think I already recommended this book, so I'll recommend it again. It's really, really good. So um, Hofstadter talks a lot about this, because uh, it's a little bit like, well, how do we reproduce? Our bodies can't have a map of our bodies, because then they would have to have the map of the map and the map of the map of the map. But we know that's not how it works. 
um, even if even ignoring all the sex part. If we're asexual creatures, we have this great thing called DNA. It isn't a map of the body. It's more like a description of a developmental process which leads to the body, which creates the body. So you don't need to describe the final result. You just need to give sort of an informational part and then some basic instructions about how to unpack that information. And lo and behold, you do that and you get the whole organism that you had doing that before, which is quite marvelous. So apparently the logician Quine came up with a similar way to do this. So here's, and here's how we, here's how Hofstadter wrote it. I, you know, he likes words. Anyway, um, yields falsehood when, uh, well, actually, uh, let's not do that version first. Here, here's, here's how I do it. F of, let's first define a function f of x, um, where x is a string, and it returns x followed by quote x quote. OK? So now I want a string which produces itself. And that would be, um, I'm sorry, let, let me write it this way. It returns this string. So f of f, f applied to this string f returns that string, parenthesis, that string. That's the idea. So, uh, so here's this version: yields falsehood when followed. Uh, sorry, when appended to its quotation. Yields falsehood when it. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> when appended to its quotation. Okay. Uh, so this this string on its face, the words this sentence aren't here. So this string is not referring to itself in any direct way. Okay. It looks as if this, the second half of the sentence, is just a claim about the first half. What it's really saying is, you know, it's really saying a string S is false if you append it to its quotation. Well, that seems like a reasonable, I mean, it seems a funny thing to do, to take a string. So by the way, what do we might by append it to its quotation? I'm saying take this string and change it to quote s unquote s. That's what I mean by append s to its quotation. OK? okay. Well, this is a funny thing to do to a string. But you can certainly do it. Mm -hmm. Now, this sentence says about this string S, if you do this, you'll get a falsehood. This sentence is saying that about a string which happens to be this string. But if you take this string and append it to its quotation, you get the whole sentence you had before. So this sentence does say this sentence is false. It is a paradox, but it doesn't say it directly. It doesn't just directly refer to the sentence. It tells you how to build the sentence. <coughs> All right. Anyway, so something similar is going on here. The lambda calculus doesn't allow me to say 
um, I'm, I'm the fixed point. It doesn't allow that first person pronoun. But this is a, uh, an instruction that says, take the following string and put it next to itself. But if you apply that to this string, you get the whole thing you had before. Anyway, I'm trying to convince you that there's something deep and interesting here. But you should read the book if you, <laughs> if I haven't. You know, this is 75% of the questions in the final will be about today's lecture. So <laughs> I hope that you've absorbed it and that you appreciate it. All right, so let's end today with the, uh, uh, well, I've run out of time. I don't have enough time now to really tell you about the Turing machine. So I'll tell you about the Turing machine on Tuesday. And uh, yes, it's a, but, but you need historical lessons, right? This is part of the cultural problem with computer science. It's all about, oh, that's so, that's so late 90s or that's so early aughts. I mean, it's already 2008. You should realize that the things that you're doing as computer scientists now have deep roots. And I mean, I only went back to 1930 here. Except with Euclid's algorithm, of course, we're going back 2,000 years. But you should, these things have deep roots. And, and these, these concepts that we have now, hardware, software, programs, compilers, interpreters, recursion, these concepts took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. You know, people, people died to bring you these concepts. So all right, see you on Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Graphics. Oh, yeah. Someone wants to view it. It's fast. It's a confusing one now. Is it next time? He said he wasn't going to get it. But is there anything about it? Because he said that. Great. It's 7 through 11. I know. It's not just what he just said. What did he get? He said, namely, April 7th. He doesn't say what he said. He's not reading. We don't have our homework. So it's not next week. Oh, you did reader. Yeah. 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 Yeah.